right, so we get started. Fantastic. Well, welcome everybody to an evening with Hetty McKinnon. We are here to launch the latest and greatest publication to Asia with love. Thanks to Kino Kinnear this evening. This beautiful, beautiful tome here. And uh, my name is Melissa Leong. Thank you so much for joining this evening. And I am Benjamin Law. Hey, Mel. Um, hey. Look, thanks for joining us, everyone, here on this school night, especially. Um, Melissa and I are particularly pleased and honoured to be joining you here from Gadigal Land, which is me, and Wurundjeri Land, which is Melissa. Uh, and it makes us think that First Nations people on this continent have been sharing knowledge and making amazing food here for tens of thousands of years, um, the oldest continuing civilization the planet's ever seen. And we're particularly grateful to elders past and present that we can continue making food and sharing knowledge here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. We are so pleased to be joined by Hesse this evening. I am a huge fan of hers. I have been for quite a few years now. Uh, years ago, I used to have an office in Surrey Hills and through whispers of people who loved food, I was told about this magical woman who, if you asked very nicely, would ride over on her bicycle <laughs> and drop off a delicious, nutritious, wholesome, soulful <laughs> bowl of food. And I just had to try. And luckily she said yes. And she came over and she <laughs> dropped me off my lunch. And I was so fangirling out. <laughs> I love that you can confirm this myth, M Melissa, because you know, for those of us who are heady um, McKinnon fanboys, girls, uh, we know this story, but you were there in those days where it was bike delivery only. It um, actually for... happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who have not been sucked into the Hetty McKinnon church slash cult, we're here to educate you. Um, Hetty McKinnon <laughs> is a cook and a food writer with a passion for vegetables. Um, in 2011, she established Arthur Street Kitchen, and that is the local salad delivery business that Mel was talking about. And she's the author of this modern classic cookbook that is in so many of our kitchens now. Community, it's changed the, so, it's changed the way that so many of us uh, cook and eat vegetables. And she's also the author of Neighbourhood and the Award-Winning Family. And she writes like heaps. She uh, is the editor and publisher of Food Journal Peddler, hosts the podcast, The House Specials. And you can see her recipes and her writing in ABC Live, Good Food, Bon Appetit, Epicurious, Food and Wine and The Guardian. And recently, the New York Frickin' Times. Uh, Hedy, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us at the Witching oh Hour from um, New York City. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ben. Hi, Melissa. So Hi, just Hilary. confirm to those, um, those listeners out there who don't know, who haven't uh, looked up the global clock yet, what time is it in Brooklyn, New York right now? It's uh, 5.08 a.m. I don't get that up this cruel. early for just anybody. For us. For us. We are all feeling I'll get special right now. Yes. <laughs> this is the only time I get to see you, so I'm, I'm willing to do it. But, you know, Melissa, it's interesting you mentioned the, um, the salad delivery because I remember that day so clearly. I remember your office. You had a little dog in there. Yes. Yeah, my little and dog. I, just, I had a little French and, little bulldog. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I, I remember all the dogs of the neighbourhood back then. And it's so funny because I always, almost remember what you were wearing. Um, and it was just all, those, all those delivery days were so vibrant in my mind still. And you, you say, um, I said yes to you. And it's true because I was like the salad Nazi. Um, <laughs> if you didn't live on the right street. Um, I didn't do it in a mean way, but it's just that I couldn't deliver that many salads. So I had to be really strict about where I delivered to and, you know, how many I could deliver to people. So, um, yes, you were lucky I said yes. <laughs> You know, I, as, was as I, lucky, I was lucky that you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> as I hear, Hedy, you telling this story, which sounds like the premise of a rom-com between two women, it also <laughs> makes me wonder, like, where did the idea of delivering salad by bike even come from? Oh, it's so weird. Right, so in the beginning, I delivered with a grandma trolley. And um, it was very non-effective as a 
mode of communication and delivery. So, um, oh, someone's just actually DM'd me and said, I can confirm I was denied the salad. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> You're a salad <laughs> denier, Hessie. I'm a salad denier. But you know, hey, you know what you else? In, you were in. Uh, that's exactly. I mean, you know what else goes with a girl on girl rom com? Rose. Oh, I hope this is okay. Nice. I hope that there are people out there that are having an evening glass of wine with me. So cheers to you. Cheers to Hetty. Congratulations cheers, on this Thank incredible you. book that we're going to be talking a lot more about when we don't get sidetracked very, very soon. By salad. It's easy to get by, sidetracked by salad. Um, but yeah, in terms of the idea, it was kind of like just, it wasn't really a, a business idea. It was just that I kind of wanted to cook the food that I was eating at home and share it with others. And who I didn't know people would actually like it. But and, and to be honest, <laughs> I really wanted to get away from working in an office. So I was like, I would do anything to not go back to working in an office. So I said, just going to make salads and deliver them around my neighborhood. And man, I just loved those days so much. They were like the magic days when, when I, when I think about it, like that's why it was so amazing to be able to do the revised version of community, which Benjamin is in um, because (laughs) it's, it's kind of like celebrating all the people who have loved this book so much over the years and have cooked from it. And I wanted to include their story too because honestly yeah. they're the most important part of the story you guys so can yeah. you remember at what point did you feel like this is becoming something much greater than <clears throat> just me making my salads in my kitchen on a friday you know yeah, on a friday um, morning i never wanted to admit that it was anything other than just this little thing um i i think when the, the self-published version of community came out that I just want, I just created for the people in my neighborhood. Um, When that sold out in like three weeks, like a thousand copies, me sending them all out from my lounge room, then I realized, wow, other people are really into this idea too. So that was kind of my time when I was like, well, I need to do something, you know, like that's when I escaped to New York. (laughs) You know, because I'm not very good at like, for me, it was never about having a business. It was about creating a community. And when people wanted to make it something else, um, particularly when the book came out nationally, it was so much, so much demands for little old me to deal with. And that's where I ran away. No, I'm, only, I'm joking. That's, that's not the reason I ran away. But um, it's, I, I love the creation. I love the creation point of something. I don't I don't love dealing with like the, when some, I mean, you guys would understand this, you know, like when you're creating a little project and you're just so passionate about it and then it becomes something else. So yeah, I think what's really, yeah. I think what's really magical about it is even though this is now your third book, you have still managed to create a a (coughs) sense of close community that now spans the world. I mean, we have, please, you know, let us know where you, where you're listening in from, because I've seen, I think uh, elsewhere in Canada and um, I think we have some, um, I I was promised some friends from, um, from Italy and from all over the place. So that's, um, sorry, I should say fourth book, not third book, you know, reissue, but yes, Um, (laughs) uh, just to be, just to be specific, because of course we are Asian, so we're going to be just that bit more <laughs> Get our numbers yeah. right, Mel. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, but you, you've managed to create a community that now spans the globe, but it still feels uh, personal. It, it still feels special. And I yeah. think that that really, that really takes a commitment to um, really holding onto that kernel of truth and not letting go of that. Because like you said, commercialization and popularity can, and can often change yeah. and distort the original kind of intent of something, but you've managed yeah. to kind of really protect that, which is uh, really inspiring. Yeah. It's so important to me, you know, like finding, I don't think authenticity is the right word, but finding truth in what I'm doing is my number one goal in every piece of work that I do, every recipe I create, doesn't matter where it's for, it's like finding that truth in that recipe and the story in that recipe. Um, And yeah, I mean, I think my work is getting more personal, definitely. Mm. It's getting, I didn't think it could, like I feel like all my books 
has felt very personal to me at that particular time. But this book is definitely, um, sometimes when I read the pages, I cry to myself. <laughs> it was really pathetic. I cried when I read it. Um, I'm so I'm so impressed. It is a so it is a much more personal book because of course you styled it, you shot it, you know, and you shot it on film. So it's not like you get the immediacy of being able to just shoot mm. it and look at it and go, oh, let's try that again. I mean, there yeah. is just such a personal quality because you have literally touched every single facet um, of it. I mean, what was it like being a you are you're an official slashy, you know, you're a, a writer, <laughs> speaker, <laughs> uh, photographer, she's a triple stylist. threat. Dancer, You're, actor, model. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest slushy on the planet, I think. <laughs> but when but it, are you an Ambi Turner? <laughs> anyway, let's you know, get back to talking, the book. <laughs> yeah, because this, you know, when you say <laughs> that this is getting even more personal, like after after family, after neighborhood, after community, neighborhood, then family, mm. you know, how did you know that this was going to be the next book like where did you get that hunch from and did you have a mission statement going into this honestly the books always just come to me as well the first three books came to me as titles so um I knew that I was going to write neighborhood before I even knew what was going to be in the book um I knew that I wanted a book called family after I wrote neighborhood but this one um was different because it came as a concept first I knew I wanted to write a, a book that celebrated the food of my culture um, and it's probably through the work I've been doing with Peddler that really led me here like Peddler has been this other journey which has allowed me to um, write about things that I often would think that other people wouldn't be interested in that's that that they're the things that really interest me it's like these really small stories that you think only affect you but somehow resonates with other people so Pedler was that project and after I worked on that I thought this is just for us it's a it's an independent magazine so it's never going to reach the people that like a book published internationally would read. So I really had that calling to, to celebrate my, my Asian culture through a book. And I feel very lucky over the years because I feel like my readers have sticked with me through all the books and through my evolution as a person, as a writer, as a food writer. Um, and I just felt like the time was ready. But incidentally, when I first thought of this book, I actually thought it was a risk. Like I thought for me to write an Asian book felt like a risk. I mean, luckily I think I've been proved wrong. Um, what did you think the risk was exactly? That I was going to present myself as overly Asian, which is something I I feel like I have never presented. You know, like I talk about this in the book of feeling uncomfortable with my identity growing up of yeah. feeling culturally confused, of feeling like I just wanted to whitewash who I was. And I think that I've definitely done that previously in my careers in PR and now through food and through cooking and through writing about food, I feel like I've just really come home. You know, like I'm, I'm really proud to be who I am. I'm proud to look at myself on a computer screen and go, I'm a Chinese Australian person who holds um, all these stories in my, in me, in my family, and I'm, I'm ready to celebrate those stories, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I might cry again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we definitely feel that too. I mean, you know, I'm first generation um, Singaporean Chinese is, is reasonably well documented <laughs> these days, but, uh, and, it, and, you know, a lot of my childhood growing up in, in Australia, I did nippers and I did little athletics and mm -hmm. I did, you know, all of the, you know, all that stuff. But I also did Kumon and I did piano and I did flute and I did <laughs> ballet. And, you know, so there was, there's very much, you know, what resonated with me in, in the introduction to the book was feeling like you were straddling two sides of, you know, a, a chasm in a way. And you desire so desperately as a, as a young person to want to feel accepted and understood by everybody around you, whether or not that's your school kids and your school mm -hmm. friends or your, you know, your, your heart yep. and your soul, your family and your community. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for me, it's certainly taken a long time to consolidate that and to feel like I can celebrate my Asian-ness as yeah. well because it's sort of been suppressed for such a long time. And, mm -hmm. 
you know, now I'm down with my, you know, my straight eyelashes and my, you know, <laughs> my, my freckles on Asian skin and all of the rest of it. I mean, how about you, Benjamin? I mean, well, Mel, you and I have talked about how we grew up in very white beachside parts of the country, you know, like you grew up like kind of in the Shire, is that right? From yep. memory or? Yep. I did many things at Allura Surf Club. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I tried to do surf lifesaving and that was a disaster. Like, I grew up in the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And I feel like what you're saying, what you're both saying resonates with me. And I even see in the comments how much it's resonating with Chinese Australians and more broadly Asian Australians. And Hedy, you know, when I see the recipes in this book, I feel like that kind of marrying... Um, and accepting and celebrating of these mm-hmm. dual cultures and the way that they can actually complement and come together manifests in the food itself. Because as much as there's traditional, recognisable, um, you know, old favourites like uh, yum cha style restaurant greens, for instance, oh, so there's good. also um, so buttery miso Vegemite noodles. Like, mm-hmm. tell us about that recipe, how it came about and, and what it represents. So honestly, the, the way the book that turned out is actually a surprise to me. When I first thought of the book and when I first proposed the book, I thought it would be a traditional Chinese book, um, you know, writing down my mother's recipes, basically. But as I started writing it from the other side of the world to my mother, um, I did, there were some certain recipes I wanted to include. But as I was working on the book, I, led, I, I went down this other path. I started thinking of the foods that I loved as a kid. And I loved a lot of Asian food, but there's also like, like Vegemite, like I ate, ate Vegemite every day when I was trying to assimilate at school. And, um, you know, all those, uh, I just kind of got to the point where it's like, I'm not, I'm not as authentically Chinese as my mother. So why would I write that book that my, yeah. that someone like my mother's generation would write? You know, mm-hmm. I'm not true blue Australian in the sense that I'm blonde and blue eyed and grew up in an Australian household where I ate meat and three veg every night. That, that didn't happen for me. So I'm somewhere in the middle, which I kind of think is kind of like a third culture. This is this, my own interpretation of, my, of these two cultures, but also of the world around me, you know, as a person that's lived away from Australia twice in my life um, and just having those influences too. Um, so this is the book that came out and it's, I just feel like it's such a strong reflection of not only me, but just the way a lot of third culture kids grow up, you know, where, where you're straddling lots of influences and you're trying to fit into all those boxes and you kind of arrive at your own place. And it took me a long time to arrive at my own place, but I, I, here I am in this book. Can I also <laughs> ask how you arrive at certain recipes as well? Because I imagine like a lot of us are familiar using miso, using noodles, mm. using Vegemite separately. And some people <laughs> might look at the, the recipe for something like that and it's like, what the hell? What like, the hell? How did yeah, that sorry. Even come about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, see, the, the Vegemite and cheese thing is something I've, I've carried around in my head for years. Like I wanted to do a Vegemite and cheese salad. Um, and it had something to do with like maybe breadcrumbs that have been soaked in butter in a Vegemite mixture and then baked. Uh, so it's like wow. this. And then, you know, you know like... So, that, that was the yeah. Yes, yes, right? Okay. But, um, when <laughs> Benjamin's I, like, yeah! <laughs> I'm going to do it for ABC Life. <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but in terms of this salad, like I wanted to create that Vegemite and cheese um, idea and that feeling you get, you know, when you, you bite into that it kind of that, and it's all about chasing umami. I'm like, as a vegetarian, I'm always chasing umami in the food that I cook. So what's more umami than Vegemite? What's umami, more umami than miso? I mean, miso just adds mm. that little bit of it, it cuts through that, that saltiness of Vegemite, but adds that sweetness, bit of funkiness, which I just love so much in my food. And then I just top it off with a heap of cheese and then noodles. <laughs> and how can you go wrong? Like I love it. I mean, I think this, this, um, I think we're so fortunate to have you, you know, as the, you know, part of this third culture because there we can, we can appreciate both sides and what's met in the middle and blurred together. And there's something beautiful in that, you know, that new creation of something entirely different that's entirely you and something and yet completely relatable to so many people as well which is 
Brilliant. Um, can we talk a little bit about one of my favourite things, which is I was cooking rendang the other day, beef rendang, because it's one of my mum's, you know, one of my mum's recipes that I cook when I'm homesick. And this is probably the longest period of time I haven't actually been, you know, in the same room as my mum because of this whole sort of lockdown situation. And you, you have created a, a version that you say even your meat eating husband adores, which is based in mushrooms, right? Yeah. So uh, that was actually inspired by Mel. I was, I was, I was during quarantine, I was obsessed with MasterChef. Um, Do you my, know this story, Mel? <laughs> this is not a paid advertisement, by the way. No, um, it's not. I think you I... mentioned it in passing, but like, I didn't realize you meant like my rendang. So, well, your rendang because I, I, you know, like this. I grew up as in a Chinese household because I've eaten a lot of meat, right, in my life yeah. up until when I was yeah. nineteen and I became vegetarian. But there are certain meals that I've never eaten, and rendang is one of them. So mm. I've never actually experienced the glory of that dish so, but when I saw you make it on MasterChef I was like I just need to try this so I did a lot of research um, and I kind of like took away what you were talk, what you said on on the show and I, I created this recipe and and my husband when he smelled it when he walked into the kitchen he's like you're making rangdan and he just knew it without yes. it. it's just from the smell <laughs> and I think you know, smell is such a big thing, isn't it? Like when I make fur, when I make, I used to, you know, the fur salad that's in one of my books, I don't know which one it's in now. Um, <laughs> when I make that, my daughter will walk in and she's like, oh, you've made fur. So it's like, yeah. that's, it's achieving that smell is, is a big part of creating the right flavours, right? So yeah. um, but that is, I've had a lot of people have been making that, that, that recipe is on good food, by the way, to people who haven't, who, who may be interested. But it's, um, for me, I'm always trying to create those flavours that everybody else, else is experiencing, but we plant-based people can't enjoy anymore. So um, it was a challenge, that recipe, actually, because it was very new to me. Um, the way it's created is really new to me. So it was an exciting recipe to create. And I'm, I'm so happy everybody's making it and people are putting their own spin on it. People are adding potatoes and I've seen jackfruit. So it's really cool. I love it. Jack, people... Jackfruit's a game changer. I hadn't had that yeah. one up until not that long ago. And just the texture and how it becomes so meaty yeah. is such an impressive so thing. Yeah, pulled mm. jackfruit is such a big thing yeah. in vegetarian tacos nowadays. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. It's huge, yeah. but I love it when people change recipes. It's like one of my favorite things because I just feel like that's how recipes evolve. When people, that's people it. sometimes apologize to me and say, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't have X, so I replaced it with Y. And I'm like, I love that because <laughs> it shows like confidence in cooking. And I think that's what I'm always trying to instill in, in my readers and just have confidence in what you cook, but who cares if it's not? And like exactly the way the recipe writer wanted it you have to cook with what you have right? especially in quarantine so yeah I but it's much in the, the same way that you also adapted so many meat-based you know yes. dishes and made them vegetarian over the years is that I, it's knowing what's missing and being able to substitute it with something that gives you that similar sort of vibe of flavor or texture or aroma yeah. that will sort of um you know you can never truly substitute it, but it can complete yeah. the, the picture in terms of all of those puzzle pieces needing to click together and, and form something cohesive. Absolutely. Mm. I think that I, I've had to, you know, like over the years, when I became vegetarian as a late, in my late teens, my mum started adapting the recipes that she was cooking. So I already had like a taste of that. I, I knew it was possible. And then when I moved away from home, it was, um, there was kind of, the years when I was, was cooking like mainly Western food, I wasn't cooking any Chinese food at all. Um, and it was really only when I moved away that I thought if I want to eat those foods that I grew up with, I have to learn to, to make them vegetarian. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of them are in this book. I, I mean, it's amazing when the first time I made jok, um, congee was like this, you know, I felt, I felt like my mother. I felt like I'd become my mother and it was, but it's, you know, like we, we all get there, isn't it? You know, it's a cycle, circle of life. Um, but it was, all, some of these recipes have been really important for me as a person 
to cook, you know, to actually to, to connect with my childhood and who I am and the, the flavors I grew up with. Um, for me to be able to cook a lot of these things is so empowering to me as a person. Um, but a lot of this is because I live away from home now. So um, being away from my mum's cooking and away from that influence, um, that daily influence, definitely affects um, the things that I want to cook. Oh, you're making us all emotional now, Penny. <laughs> oh, about our my life goal. And... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> my I mean, life goal is Benjamin. <laughs> But even emotional. talking about jook, even talking about congee, I think like for all, especially like Chinese and more broadly Asian kids, we all have a version of congee in our household. We eat it when we're sick. We eat it when we're recovering. It's comfort food. Um, yeah. And it makes us think of all of our moms. I, I want to ask you, Hedy, you know, um, this is a recurring thing for people who know your work and your recipes that um, some of your recipes kind of start overtaking our lives. So there was something you published in ABC Life earlier this year, the mushroom miso carbonara. And I think like in this year, I feel like I've made a trough of it. Like I've probably made <laughs> pockets that I could take out and feed armies with. Um, what about for you as the author of this book? Like what, what recipes have from this have completely consumed you for periods at end? Oh man. I mean, I think the, um, the, the Vegemite miso um, noodles is my kid's favorite. My daughter in particular loves it. She also loves um, the salt and pepper potatoes. So mm. we've made that a lot. Um, it's really weird. Like if, if people may not try it, they might think it's like a really weird recipe, but the sensation of my mum used to make, I ate this dish at a, um, it was like a Nepalese restaurant in, in Queens. And when I ate it, I remembered a dish that my mum used to make, which is, you know, potatoes, like very, like very finely julian potatoes, which are just stir fried, but they're still quite crisp. So you don't cook them, you don't overcook them. So we, we make that one a lot. And the potato and leek momos we make, we mm. love, my kids are like potato freaks. So um, they'll eat anything with potatoes. <laughs> I didn't cook, I didn't give them potatoes for like, I don't know, 10 years of their lives and now all I make is potatoes. So, They're compensating. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. But we, I mean, honestly, we don't make that many traditional dumplings in our life. We make a lot of dumplings, but we put like whatever inside. I mean, that's a bit of a kitchen hack of mine. Like I put leftovers in there, in my dumplings. It's kind of, it sounds weird. Look at Benjamin's face does not look happy about this. <laughs> no, I am, no, that is a look of interest and enthusiasm, <laughs> delight, maybe mild horror. But what kind, of horror. Are you, what kind of leftovers are you talking about? What, what could end up in the dumpling? Like salad leftovers. Like I've done, um, like, you know, like you've got like a beanie, like a bean, like a legume salad and there's some sort of vegetable. You can just kind of like chop it up really fine and put that in the in the in the dumpling. So the dumpling. <laughs> I just yes. love. I'm sitting here and on the Zoom call, I have like you, Ben, and you, Hetty, next to each other, and I'm just going back and forth between the faces, going, selling it, selling it, sold, no, what? But, but how often do you encounter this face where people are trying to? Because with, with vegetarianism, especially, you know, you, you kind of have to remix the, the recipes like you were talking about yep. before. And some of those remixes are quite audacious. And I imagine yes. to some people, they're like, how dare you? That's not cabanara or how dare you put veggies? Yes. Like, how do you deal with that conversation? <sighs> it's, it's a tough one. I mean, I think, I mean, essentially, it's not cabanara anymore, right? Because um, it's made with miso and mushroom. But I, I think that, um, my audience is very appreciative of me delivering that, you know, that recipe. Um, I've always felt that, but I'm very careful with the way the language um, around recipes and the way I present them. I mean, I think right now it's food writing has changed so much in 2020 and the way we write recipes and the way we present our head notes. So I'm always very careful about our food, like recipe origins. Um, I don't know. I think it's a really tough question because we're still trying to get to that point where we, where we show due respect to that recipe, but you know, what gives us the license to change 
something like a kabbadah or something that's very traditional yeah. to um, people, many people in the world. So I just try and be as respectful to the origins as I can. But um, I don't know. What about you, Mel? <laughs> Yeah, no, I was, just, I was just thinking about that because, of course, you know, we do our best as conscious human beings to respect the origins of things and we do our research and we know where things come from or we, we do our best to find out. And then there's sort of this other, this other part where we take, you know, ideas from places and create something new and they can be wonderful. And sometimes there's, some, there's guilt involved or there's trepidation involved in, okay, if I, if I just saw it pop up on the screen, you're, you're kacho pepe udon. And it's like, well, what gives, you, what gives you license to do that? But at the same time, you know, for me as a food writer and, a, and an avid eater, I think, well, is it fucking delicious? Like, is it delicious? Yeah. Yeah. Because if it's delicious, then there's a really good case for why you should make it, you know. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, reflecting back on, I mean, I've just finished uh, filming Junior and there was a, um, a challenge where it was a very open challenge and one of the kids who will rena- remain unnamed um, until we get there but um, took the interpretation as being related to the dream time. And he is not Indigenous in any way. And he said, well, this, I went to see um, an, an, an Aboriginal art gallery and I was inspired by a dot painting. And I thought, wow, no adult would do that if they weren't of an Indigenous heritage because we would feel like we weren't um, being respectful in some way. We might feel the baggage or the heaviness of, you know, what has occurred, you know, on this ancient land that we are lucky enough to live on. Um, But watching this kid, you know, cook, there was just complete joy, complete lightness. It was about a very pure inspiration, a very honest place. And, um, and it was beautifully interpreted, you know, it just absolutely blew me away. And I sort of thought, well, maybe I need to come back to thinking about, um, the importance of intent, because if you were thinking about things in that capacity, then I, I can't I can't fault this kid for interpreting the idea that they did. So, mm. you know, I think that it has to come from a place of respect, as you say, Hetty, first and foremost, and then you explain um, in very real and honest terms, your interpretation and the reason why you've done that. And it could be mm-hmm. as simple as this is not authentic. It comes from this place, but it's fucking delicious. So maybe you should try it. Um, yeah. And that could be enough because it's still honest, right? Yeah. And I think you, that, that you go, no, I, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, in terms of the way I started out cooking, you know, if you look at community, there's a lot of Middle Eastern salads in there. There's a lot of um, Mediterranean. I've always cooked flavors from other cultures because that is really the way me learning, like community is me learning to cook. That's what that book is. So that's me learning about flavor. That's me learning about how to combine spices um, in a way that brings the most out of uh, a vegetable or, you know, whatever ingredient I'm using. And uh, I mean, that's, that's the way I've learned a lot about the world for me. Um, I've traveled a lot, you know, in my younger years and being able to relive those experiences on the plate and recreate like that feeling like this food is so evocative, you know, like I can imagine myself in Positano eating, uh, you know, a pasta and uh, a caprese dish just from, you know, like just, it's so evocative. And, and for me, it's um, a really great way of, honoring memories and honoring experiences that we've lived so um, um, but I always try and be, being respectful is so important and particularly now mm-hmm. in the age that we live in and the the, the landscape of food writing um, we have to be even more respectful I think you know we have to just think we, it has to be front of mind when we're creating a recipe um, how are we going to honor the origins of this recipe mm. yeah you know I've got a, I've got a slightly you know, an extended take of what both of you were saying, you know, with this book in particular, like, of course, it's to Asia with love and it honours so much of, um, you know, the, the shared cultural heritages that, that the three of us and many people in this Zoom call have too. But as I read it as well, and because you're incorporating things like Vegemite and memories of an Asian Australian childhood, I think as much as it's an Asian cookbook, it strikes me as a very Australian 
yeah. you know, the idea of what Australian cuisine can and should be, I don't think is not necessarily settled. And I think that that's an mm. exciting thing. I think mm. like there have been some years where fur feels like the national dish and sushi and feels like the national squid. dish. Salt yeah. pepper squid becomes a national <laughs> dish and the curry pie is our national dish as well. And I feel yeah. like, you know, that this actually feels particularly Australian and maybe it's my version of what yeah. Australian food yeah. is because I, I grew up I in think... this country with this food. Yeah, I think that's really exciting. You know, we we live in, um, in terms of our most recent history, we're still, you know, it's still formative in terms of what we describe as being, you know, modern Australian or Australian cuisine. It's a, you know, it's a culmination of all of the cultures of the world, plus our ancient Indigenous heritage coming together mm. and, and forming something entirely different and wonderful. And it's happening as we're talking, it's happening as we write about it and we speak about it, which is really, really exciting and I think you know when I was growing up and people from uh, friends from overseas would come over and say well what is Australian food and I sort of struggled to answer that Mm. I think now I'm excited by not necessarily being able to answer that because we still don't know what it is yet and that's really great I absolutely agree with you you know I I think that the um sorry sorry. no no I was going to say the 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 intent with this book is to really say to people, well, I think, so right now I think it's really, really important to go to your Asian supermarket. You know, I think it's like in New York, you know, like Chinese businesses, or Asian businesses are really struggling and there's a lot of businesses closing down due to COVID and due to xenophobia and all those things. So really important to go to your, your Chinese and Asian supermarket. Yeah. But um, the other intent with this book is to really democratise Asian food. You know, over the years, so many people have said to me, I would cook Asian food every night if I could, if I just knew how to cook it. You know, and so I just really wanted to show people that it's really achievable with you know, I wanted to say, you know, your Asian pantry is your everyday pantry. You've probably got all this stuff in your pantry anyway, like miso and rice wine vinegar and all these, all these soy, soy sauce. Who doesn't have soy sauce? And, and all the iterations of soy sauce. So I really wanted to approach a, a really de- democratic way of approaching these flavors. Like you can achieve these with what you've got already. It's not scary. It's not unattainable. It's really achievable on an everyday basis. So that was one of the intents behind this book. I like that. It's demystifying. And I think, you know, you do that for a lot of people who are exploring eating a more plant-based diet as well. And, you know, whether or not you eat meat some of the time or all of the time, but you really just love vegetables and you really want to know how to cook them. I think there's um, a little bit of fear about, well, how do I make a salad delicious? And you've been able to walk people through, you know, what that's like and how to kind of get the best out of that and so this is sort of you know again you've you've treated this democratization or um you know or accessible you know making it making asian food accessible you've tre- you're treating it with love and um in a way that people can sort of find um approachable which is really lovely but what i was going to ask you is i think the first question ben wrote on our list um was you know could you take us to you know in terms of when you were speaking about how transportive food is Um, in the inception of this book, you know, can you take us to your family kitchen where you grew up and what was that like? I felt like my entire house was a kitchen. You know, my, um, there was just food everywhere. I mean, we, we lived in like this two story, very suburban Sydney house, um, upstairs, downstairs. We renovated in the eighties. It it still looks like that. It's a very eighties house. My mum still lives there actually. Um, so, you know, it was, I just felt like there was food all around me and all the action in the house was in the kitchen, you know, all the sounds, the the smells, um, my mum's exhaust fan that was always, whenever the exhaust fan was on, I knew she was making something good because she only had, she had an electric cooktop and one gas hob. And whenever she used the gas hob, she'd put the exhaust fan on. So I knew that it was something good coming out of that walk. So um, it was, we were just very surrounded by food. I didn't appreciate it at all when I was growing up. I just thought, oh God, you know, more food, there's overabundance of food. But, um, you know, there was in our laundry, there was um, eggs being preserved 
on our patio. There was meat hanging, there was fish, fish being, you know, salted fish. There was pork, you know, la- your, um, there was all this, just food everywhere. And then our clothes hung next to the, 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 the foods that were preserving, very, very Asian. Um, and then my dad actually, and I think my dad, I haven't, my, I've woven my dad into this story more because it's something that I felt like my dad passed away when I was a teenager and I don't feel like I've ever given him enough credence for the, my roots in food. My dad worked at the at Flemington markets and um, he was a banana trade. He worked in banana trading and he, he just brought home so much food. So, you know, like, can you imagine we never ate, we never ever went to a grocer. We never bought fruit and vegetables. We, my dad brought home crates of, I just remember summer, you know, the stone fruit, the first mangoes, the first cherries of the season. I mean, the apricots of my youth, I talked about this on ABC Conversations, you know, like I've been chasing the flavor of the apricots of my youth for my entire life. I don't think I'll ever find them because the flavor um, is just, of Australian summer, you know, like as a eight year old. Um, so we were just, yeah, my house was very food focused and it's probably not something that I appreciated then, but um, I do appreciate it now. <laughs> yeah, someone asked me about that recently and I just sort of said, you know, to the interviewer wasn't Asian. And I said, well, look, I'm Chinese and so we don't, I mean, I know Ben's family might be a little bit different, but like we don't, my parents aren't big huggers or like hand holders yeah. or like yeah. overly, our love language is food. Mm-hmm. You know, the way yeah. we show how much we love each other is that we buy food together. We talk about food, we cook mm-hmm. food together, we eat together, we talk about where we're going out to eat. Um, and that is, you know, something that I'm very grateful for growing up is that, it is just part of how we communicate. And yes. I think that's why when people are like, oh, how do you describe food? So like in, in the way that you do, I said, well, because we have never stopped talking about food since we were yeah. born, right? Yeah. yeah. We're obsessed I mean, I, with it, you know, our obsessed. people. Obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> obsessed is, is to put it lightly, to be honest with you. I mean, my goodness. It's, it's got, a way um, of life. We've got a lot of questions coming in, but just before we cry with them, two things, Hetty. One, um, my mum is a hugger, so she's an outlier in the Chinese community, but my dad is not. And he, even to this day, just has like crates of bananas as a hello. You know, that's hello. Just, I've got a box of fruit and we have to divide it. And it's this military operation between the siblings. <laughs> Um, the second thing I want to ask you before we throw it to um, audience questions is a question um, that they start with um, Samin Nozrat and Hrishi Kresh Hiwe's podcast, Home Cooking. I don't know if either mm-hmm. of you have listened to it. It's been my pandemic fave. Which is what is the most delicious thing that you've eaten lately? Is it is it from this cookbook, perhaps? Um, it's, it's It's a similar theme. Mm-hmm. Last night... We went to China, we ordered food. I'm very conscious of helping Chinatown businesses and and going to Chinatown. And I've, it's one of the things I've missed the most. Um, living in New York, Chinatown is, is my happy place. It's when I feel, you know, after the elections of 2016, the day after I went to Chinatown and I walked around and I spoke my bad Cantonese to anyone who would listen to me. And it's um, the way I, I comfort myself um, being in this city that's not my home city. So I've been really missing Chinatown. My kids have been missing Chinatown. And last night um, we just, we ordered food online and then we went, we drove to Chinatown and picked it up um, in Manhattan and picked up this. So, I mean, I think I Instagrammed it in my stories. We, we, we spent like $200 on dim sum. <laughs> and my fridge is full of like you know takeout containers yeah. right now but oh um, I miss I miss Yamcha so much right Yamcha is is like home it's home and that eating that food and just seeing that the abundance on the table you know we had to recreate that so we just bought way too much food but to me that was like so good you know it was like so good so that was probably the favorite thing I've eaten in the last month or so 
Yeah. Melissa, you you've had a physical reaction still? to that. I know because I've been, we've been in lockdown. So I, during the break, during lockdowns one and two, um, there was a, there's a, a couple of Chinese restaurants that did reopen and I went mm. to a very restrained version of Yum Cha with a friend of mine, Rianne, during that time. And it was, I mean, I just needed to have it. I just had to have it. Mm. <laughs> and yep. you have yeah. your favourite things. And I think no, no matter where you come from in the world, you know, so many people love uh, Yum Cha or Dim Sum and you have your favourite things that you want. And I, all I want is like lo mei gai, you know, yeah. and <laughs> dao choi gao and, you yeah. know, ha gao siu mai, you know, si oh. jat pai gua, and, I, and sure. all of these things. And I'm just like, I just want to have them all on the table. I want to spill tea and beer and <laughs> soy make a everywhere. Scene. Make a scene. I just want to make a real scene. I want a lazy Susan. Yeah. You know, the thing. <laughs> as I hear you, I wonder if you're the same as me where, you know, my Cantonese is so rough. My cousins say that so I speak rough. like a toddler. But <laughs> as easy as language is to lose, I bet all of us speak fluent yamcha. Oh, yeah. My dad says that I speak fluent Yamcha. But, but, you know, my last question um, before we go to um, maybe the audience questions was, um, and I will use my bad Cantonese, is how important is the phrase sex fan to you? Sex fan, yes. Oh, because that's my favourite chapter. I cried when I read it. And I thought rather oh. than me reading it out, you know, what, what is the importance for those of you who don't speak Cantonese <laughs> as fluently as me? As fluently um, as me. Se- <laughs> what does, what does sekfan mean and why is it more than just the words okay. for us? So sekfan sik means, um, you know, literally it means to eat rice, but in the Chinese language, it means dinner is ready, you know, come to the table. Um, now, you know, there's a, you know, I, I, that, that's something that I heard in my house, like every single day, every single day is sick fun, come to the table. But in researching for the book, you know, I, I realized in many cultures, eating rice in many, I mean, I mean, I guess many Asian cultures, eating rice is the term used for eating dinner that dinner is ready. Um, I mean, rice is definitely something I didn't appreciate growing up. It, it's, we ate rice, a bowl of rice with, you know, a Chinese, a traditional Chinese banquet every night for dinner. And it, it was a, ri- you know, so I, I just, I kind of resented it. Like I was like, why are we eating this again? You know, I, I just wanted steak and three veg. That was one of my mum's special meals, <laughs> steak and three veg. Uh, I mean, those are my favourite meals. Like, yes, we're getting something other than rice. And now as a, as a, you know, older person who's growing up, who's um, raising three children um, in, also in, across many cultures, rice has become, you know, like this, uh, it is a language of love. It's like me connecting with my culture and, and sharing that with my my children. Um, but rice is just and, and it in my research over the years, it's such a important ingredient in so many cultures. Um, so many people in so many cultures, it's 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 just like the the roots of a meal. You know, you can have eight dishes on the table, but if you don't have rice. It, that's not dinner. Yeah. So Someone um, Vincent just said before, you know, parents, Asian parents don't say sorry. They just say sit fun. <laughs> it's so true. It's like it smooths so everything over. It's like it's time to eat. All is forgiven. Whatever yes. happened, happened. We're eating now. Yeah. And I think We're that eating. that was always yeah. the great, the great connector and the great sort of resolution of everything was just it's time <laughs> to eat, so let's just forget about the drama. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So reset. Should we bring Helene into the chat now? Helene, you've been looking at the question. Should we take some from the audience for Hetty now? I have. Yes. Yeah, so questions. we have uh, Nicola who wants to know uh, for the on behalf of the picnic in Melburnians, which recipes do you recommend that travel well and can be can eat best outdoors? Okay. Um, I think obviously there's a huge salad chapter in this and, you know, I I couldn't resist. I mean, I think whatever I do, it always goes back to salads because it's such a great love of mine. And I think there's lots of 
awesome salads um, in in here that you can make and you can take like the barn me salad. I think is an awesome one because it's hearty. It has really interesting flavors, and you can make all the components separately and then put them all together when you get get there. So you know, I think it. You know, I, I heard that picnicking is a huge thing in Melbourne right now. So um, I think there's so many like salads. In, in here which are awesome I mean noodles travel really well as long as you don't put anything on them until you until you're ready to eat so um, trying to find the recipe um that like that your arancini oh yeah that would work that would travel really well yes, oh would. and the mushroom and kimchi sausage rolls that would be a pic- that would go off at a picnic have you made that Ben because I think you're gonna love it no, I'm going to. I'm going to bookmark it I, now. I think that's your recipe. <laughs> I have so many I, pieces I know of paper inside here bookmarking everything. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because so we also hey, bloody love a sausage roll. Sorry, sorry, Helene. It's okay. That's fine. We've got a question from Jody who has a basic question. She wants to know, Hetty, is your preference for sweet or savory meals? And based on that, what would be your last meal if you had to choose? It's a hard oh, question. God. Yeah. Um, Always savoury, always. Um, I didn't grow up eating desserts, so other than fruit, fruit was our dessert. So, um, yeah. you know, your still cha- baking. Your dessert is, chapter is called Not Too Sweet. Yeah, Not Too Sweet. You know, <laughs> and I, I should mention that because people always laugh when I say that, but it's like, it's not a personal preference. It is, a, it, I mean, it is a personal preference because in Asian culture, Not Too Sweet is the highest praise you could give to a dessert. Um, you know, because you don't want to, you want to have, you want to practice this kind of, you know, that, that Chinese, that Asian space, so restraint, and you don't want to enjoy it too much. Just enjoy it just enough. So um, not too sweet, but oh, sorry, what's the question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Your last meal. My last meal <laughs> would be, my last meal, oh man, I think it's going to have to be like something my mum made, like my mum's gokjai, like her, her Cantonese dumplings. Um, or her CJ Go, which is like a potato steamed rice cake, which I still need to learn to make. And every week when I call my mom, I was like, you need to teach me this recipe. Um, and somehow she's holding it back for me for some reason. So, um, you know, Asian mom's weird, but um, yeah, probably, you know, some, one of those really, or my mom's steam egg custard. Um, oh. That, that was my dish, you know, like when my mom, it's in the book, it's probably the hardest recipe I worked on to get, um, to get the right consistency. So something like from my childhood, I would say, but maybe the steam egg custard. I could, I could go with one of that, a plate of that right now, actually. Oh, oh yes, please. Well, then another I was question. just laughing at your um, restrained Asian face. I'm like, I don't think I learned that one. <laughs> The restrained Asian? I don't think Benjamin <laughs> wants it. No, no, no. Sorry. I've gone the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Helene. That was no, that's fine. That's fine. Question, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's one more. Uh, so Rhonda wants to know, speaking about your mother and her withholding of recipes, uh, did your parents mm-hmm. hover around you judging your techniques when you first started to cook? So, um, oh, yeah. I mean... The first thing I really cooked as um, as a like a teenager was those gokje dumplings, which is um, like a wheat starch, uh, clear kind of um, dumpling wrapper, and they were my mum's specialty. And she would only allow me, so I wasn't really allowed to help in the kitchen much when I was younger. So it was something that, as a as a mid teenager, I was allowed to help. Um, like we we flattened the dumpling skins with a with a tar- with a tortilla maker i didn't realize it was a tortilla maker until i moved to the states but my mom that's was a game always- changer oh dude oh what my a- god so my mom was so I've proud been rolling and rolling. <laughs> <laughs> that's so smart yeah so she had this tortilla maker so a lot of my mum's um friends from china immigrated to the u.s and they sent her this thing and she was convinced it was a a dumpling roller so she's my whole life i'm using this thing and then i get to america and i'm at williams sonoma and i'm like why is my mum's dumpling maker at williams sonoma and 
<laughs> it's a tortilla maker. So everyone get onto that. And um, so that was one of the first recipes I made with her. But she, my mom's really critical. So she definitely, you know, overjudges everything I do. When I was doing, when I was um, making salads for Arthur Street Kitchen, she would basically come and tell me I was uh, peeling the pumpkin wrong and chopping the sweet potato in the wrong shape. So it was um, a kind of interesting time, but I love it. I love the band. <laughs> I was like, bring it on. Like when she, when I was, when I developed the noodle recipe for this, book, the, the really simple um, two ingredient, you know, hand poured noodles, she actually called me on FaceTime and she said, what are you doing? She's like, I said, I'm making noodles, but you can't make that. It's, it's way too hard for you. And I'm like, no, I can do this. So <laughs> that was one of my like, screw you, mom, I'm making the noodles. You know, I'm pulling the noodles. <laughs> I love it. Um, it's that so little bit of competition good. when you realise that your parents are just people too. And yeah. then you start getting, you know, I, I, I quite often call my mother and I really think that my Hainan chicken rice is <laughs> be better than hers now. Oh, oh. But I also love that classic, um, I love that classic Asian but also pan-ethnic mother vibe where I saw this really great tweet the other day that went viral around the world by my friend Roger Meddy and uh, she asked her mother you know how do I cook this traditional dish and her mum said it requires skills there is no recipe you don't have the skills you know <laughs> like classic classic yeah. mother I think like. I think I've definitely heard that from my mum yeah, or the deliberate sabotage of leaving out a crucial ingredient. And if you yeah. don't know, if you don't know what it is and you can't work it out, then you don't deserve to cook that thing perfectly. Oh my God. There's a MasterChef challenge, Mel. It's yeah. like all of their ethnic mothers come. I love it. I'll sell that one in. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for that. Uh, Helene, I know that we started a bit late. Do we have time for one more question or should we, do we need to wrap yeah, up? Yeah, we do. No, no, no. That's fine. If you guys are okay to hang out. Um, one more question. One more question. So Madeline would like to know, Hetty, uh, is there a particular vegetable that stops you in your tracks at the greengrocer and makes you revamp your weekly menu so that you can showcase that vegetable? So um, I don't think there's one vegetable. I love all the vegetables. I'm obsessed with vegetables. So it depends on, you know, it depends on the season. <laughs> Why is Mel laughing? <laughs> no, I just love it because you are so, you are the poster woman for veg being the most incredible, versatile, you know, wonderful thing. Oh, and man, they're so exciting. You know, they're so exciting. Yeah. Um, She's in the pocket of big veg, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But like I often, I get craving. So right now I'm craving eggplant, you know, like I'm craving wow. that, you know, steaming eggplant with black bean sauce um, oh, yeah. or, you know, with a miso eggplant. Also, I, I'm really much dri driven by a cravings. Um, and, you know, I, I love going to the market, of course, and seeing what's, um, what's, what's seasonal. But I also eat things out of season sometimes because <laughs> it's, it's craving cauliflower you just gotta have it right you gotta have it so um, <laughs> um love it's it. not one it's vegetable not... <laughs> i love them all <laughs> um julia uh Busital nakamura aka julia also just said you are the vegetable queen oh thanks julia. <laughs> <laughs> cameo from julia Welcome on it and julia. also hello <laughs> yeah and congratulations on your new cookbook julia yes um but look sadly everyone that is probably all that we've got time for tonight thank you so much for for joining us um as we celebrate and and launch this incredible cookbook to Asia with love christmas is around the corner if the idea of christmas uh shopping makes you dead inside just buy everyone a copy of this you know they'll love it um thank you so much to kinakunia books for hosting the event you can buy um hetty's book Asia with love at kinakunia if you're lucky enough to visit them in person or you can get it online and you can also watch melissa host junior master chef australia 7 30 p.m sunday to tuesday on channel 10 and 10 play i mean melissa that's technically right now i don't know how you're doing both things at once but you know who's whatever. taking care also, of the children totally before we go can we get a photo i'm gonna get a photo of the oh, Zoom call. Yes. Okay. I don't have my oh phone. my gosh people are holding up their books maybe you can just do the yeah. <laughs> how do we do it
Sorry, that was the most Asian flex I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Helene Thank from Kunikunia. No. Um, congratulations again, Hetty. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Hetty. Can I say thank mm -hmm. you to Mel and Ben for doing this with me? This is incredible. I didn't, I mean, this is like, I'm overwhelmed by your generosity in your time. I know how busy you guys are. So thank you. And thank you to Kino Kunia. I have done a book launch with them for every single one of my books. And I think you're the only bookstore that's happened with. So thank you so much for your support over the years. I am so grateful to everyone. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm going back to bed, I think. Oh, thanks, Teddy. <laughs> You're fantastic. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks Have a great everyone. night slash morning. Bye. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.